Gianni Versace was a global fashion icon, known for breaking boundaries with his designs. But there's a part of his story that's often missed. Versace died at the hands of a serial killer on the front doorstep of his own home. He was the final victim of a five month killing spree that claimed six lives across the US. But even with his killer on the FBI's most wanted list, police still struggled to put an end to his reign of terror. Today, we're gonna be discussing Gianni Versace's murder and the unhinged killing spree of Andrew Cunanan. Before we get into the case, I just wanna thank our sponsor for making this video possible, NordVPN. Regular Ellen O'Neill viewers will already know how in love I am with NordVPN, and I have been for years and years and years, and I'll tell you why. Obviously, all the usual VPN benefits, like being able to access content from other countries that isn't available to you, just general protection when you're using the internet, making sure that all of your personal information is safe. But there's so many reasons that I choose Nord VPN over other VPN services. They have a plethora of other benefits, including their threat protection feature, which is one of my favorites. It helps to protect you from malware, from trackers, from intrusive ads, all three of which scare me especially pop-up ads. Their dark web monitor notifies you if your credentials are ever leaked online, which is so useful, it gives you that peace of mind. NordVPN also have 24 seven support in case you ever need help with your account, which I think is very underrated because I know that a lot of us <laughs> use VPNs for our streaming sessions. And God forbid a streaming session is ever interrupted and I can't get help getting back into my VPN. I use it all the time to take advantage of streaming selections catalogs in other countries, because tell me why Netflix is so much better in America. I actually recently found out that South Korea has the most Academy Award winning titles available on Netflix. So if you're a film buff, travel to South Korea on a VPN. But one of my favorite perks of having a VPN is being able to access what I call the back rooms of YouTube. There are so many videos on this platform that are blocked in certain countries on different grounds, you know, whether it's copyright, whether it's, I, I don't know. I don't know why YouTube do it a lot of the time, but having a VPN and being able to travel to different countries gets you around those YouTube blocks. And I've always used it for that, especially because I uh, research cases like this and I need to be able to get onto different countries, news websites and different, you know, all, all that different stuff. I need access to the whole entire internet, not just the UK internet. And it's so useful. If you're like in university or studying or researching or anything like that, a VPN has been so essential to my work, so I would very much recommend. And NordVPN is totally risk-free with their 30-day money-back guarantee. So if you want to try, go to nordvpn.com forward slash Eleanor. There's currently a deal running where if you get a two-year plan, you get four extra months. So go take advantage. Remember the link is down below in the description box. And thanks again to NordVPN for sponsoring this video. One last thing before we get started with the case, I just wanna say, I mean, absolutely no disrespect to anyone that I talk about in this video. Everything that I'm about to say is publicly available information that myself and my team have found and compiled into this one video. This video will cover especially sensitive topics, including, but not limited to, discussion of HIV and AIDS, drug abuse and suicide. So if you feel any of these topics are a bit too intense or triggering for you, then I would recommend clicking out of this video now. Hopefully I will get to see you some other time with another case, but until then, look after yourself. And while we make every effort to fact check our sources and make sure all of our information is correct, no action should be taken in reliance upon the information in this video. And I wanna take this opportunity to remind you all that these are real people's lives that we're talking about. So please do keep everything kind and respectful in the comments. All opinions in this video are mine and mine alone. And with all of that being said, Let's get into the case of Andrew Cunanan. So today's case takes place across a five month span in mid 1997. Andrew was going state to state all across the US claiming new victims every month. But this unhinged serial killer 
had quite a normal start in life. He had a seemingly very normal, happy childhood. He was the fourth child, I believe, to parents Modesto and Marianne Cunanan. He was born in 1969 in California. At the time, Modesto was fresh out of fighting in the Vietnam War and Marianne was a stay-at-home mother looking after all of their children. They'd been together a long time, um, but they weren't very happily married, like not at all. Mary Ann had always suffered with her mental health, like all her life, but when she had children, she got really bad bouts of postnatal depression and it was the worst after the birth of Andrew, who was, you know, their, I think he was their youngest child. I don't think they had any more after him. And honestly, after hearing about this, I don't blame them. Mary Ann was so, so mentally unwell after the birth of Andrew to the point where she was practically bed bound. She was not getting out of bed. She wasn't even meeting her own needs, never mind her children's. So Modesto stepped in as kind of primary caregiver for the most part of Andrew's first year. And this led to them building a very, very deep bond. He hadn't bonded with any of his other children quite the way that he had bonded with Andrew. Modesto always said that Andrew was his best friend and also his mother, Mary Ann, to say that she couldn't be as involved in his first year, she still did grow such an intense bond with Andrew later on in life. Uh, but this is also kind of one of the negative parts of his childhood is how m how much his parents loved him. Not like that. It wasn't how much they loved him. It was the way that they loved him. Andrew was very clearly their favorite child, which was very sad to read about. Like all the other kids knew that Andrew was the favorite. They used to call him the white sheep of the family in like, you know, like the good version of the black sheep of the family because he was different to all of them. He would get praise, he would get things that they didn't get. He was allowed to get away with things that they weren't allowed to get away with. His parents also very much treated Andrew as if he was an adult when he was still very much a child. Like his father would talk to him about things that he probably shouldn't be talking about, you know, like women and etc. And his mother, would kind of trauma dump on him in a way. She used Andrew as like her therapist, especially when it came to her relationship, her marriage to his father that was very, very sour. And whenever anything would happen with her husband, she would go to her son and like trauma dump it all on him and kind of put him in the middle of his parents arguing and just, just a very inappropriate situation for a child to be in. These are worries and stresses that a child does not need. And also, what kind of advice could your like seven year old kid give you about your marriage? Um, I think it was just more of a case of his mum needed to get it all out and Andrew was like her best friend. Just a bit inappropriate, I guess. I do feel bad for him though, you know, having to bear the burden of your parents' problems in life, like that's, that's not, that's not a job for a kid that's trying to grow and develop. From a very early age, Andrew realized that his family didn't have a lot of money. Um, and this was something the family was quite insecure about. Well, obviously mainly the parents because kids don't quite have a grasp on what all that means, but it was very ingrained into their family by their parents that their financial situation was bad and that was shameful to them. Because they lived in a very middle class part of town, but they themselves, their family was working class. So they have surrounded themselves with people that are wearing more expensive clothes than them and their houses are bigger and um, just everything in general. The people that live around them have more than they have. So every time they leave the house, they're kind of reminded of the situation that they're in and I think it made those insecurities hit so much harder. Reputation was very important to the Cunanan family, well particularly to Modesto. He really really cared about what the neighbourhood thought of them. It was one of his biggest goals in life to be climbing up the class ranks um, or at least look as if they're rising up the class ranks. Like he was getting into debt and all kinds of things just to pay for things 
you know? Not not to like survive, not on a not on a basic needs level. It was like, oh, we need new shoes. I, we need the shoes that everyone else has got. Those shoes, I will take out a loan to get those shoes. It was mainly Modesto's insecurity, but because he was so bothered about it and always talked about it, he'd really ingrained it into the rest of the family that they should be behaving in a certain way and that they should be trying to seem richer than they are. So this had Andrew going to school as a little kid and lying about what his father did for a job. He would tell all his friends that his dad was a millionaire and they had all these cool things and, and they would go on trips to Europe every summer and all that kind of stuff. He would make up so many lies about just about their financial status because he thought that that is what was needed to get by in society. That's kind of what their father had taught them. But once Andrew got into the habit of lying to impress people at a young age, that never left him for the rest of his life. He was a pathological, compulsive liar, especially when it came to his reputation. I mean, even up until like in his 20s and stuff, you will see very soon that he just could not stop lying about financial stuff and the people that he knew and the things that he had and how great he was. He had this really inflated sense of self that I think originated from when he was a child and he was the favourite and he could do no wrong and he was destined for great things because he was very intelligent as well actually. He had an IQ of 147. A great IQ is, it starts at like 120. So he was already 27 IQ points, higher than the smart people. And for that reason, he was actually sent to, wait, no, I don't think he was sent to a different school, but he was put on a different program within his school that was only for the smart kids. And that made him feel even more superior to everyone around him. He was the smart kid. He was the rich kid. I mean, like, it was lies, but that's what he was at school. And then at home, he was the favourite. He was the angel boy. They used to call him Prince. He was the prince of the family, which there was another boy in the family. There were two girls and two boys. And imagine, imagine your brother got Prince and you're, you're just called by your first name. Everything that his parents did reinforced to Andrew that he should always get special treatment. It really set him going that way in life. Like they gave him the biggest bedroom in the house. And, and when I say the biggest, I mean the biggest. Even his parents didn't get a big bedroom because they gave him the master bedroom. The youngest child got the master bedroom with an ensuite and the rest of his siblings, his three other siblings, had to share two different bedrooms. The favoritism just got like more and more blatant with time. When they were young kids, it was a little bit more subtle, but as they grew up, it was kind of just an accepted fact within their family that Andrew's the favorite and he gets benefits and there's nothing anyone can do about it. So like I say, as, as they were getting a bit older, he got the master bedroom. Uh, his father at one point decided to take out a loan to buy a car, a sports car as well. It wasn't just any car, a sports car. And this car was gonna just sit in the driveway until Andrew learned to drive. He was the youngest of four children. The older siblings could drive he didn't even have his license yet and his father was gonna buy one car and it was gonna be for him and it was gonna just wait until Andrew was ready. Like, I just feel really bad for his siblings. Like, it, living with a sibling like that must have been jarring, <laughs> just plain jarring. In his late teens, Andrew Cunanan came out as gay and this changed the trajectory of his whole entire life. Because at this point, he started frequenting gay bars and he was a very attractive young man that was in very high demand. There were a lot of older, richer men at these clubs and bars that wanted to take care of Andrew, you know? They wanted to, they wanted to buy him things, they wanted to give him money, sometimes in exchange for sex. Sometimes not though, sometimes they just wanted to spend time with Andrew. So from this point, he starts various sugar daddy, sh sugar baby situations. And you know what? Andrew Cunanan loved this. This was perfect for him. The person that feels very entitled to everything in life. He loved being able to just go to a bar and not do any work and just get money. 
for it. He very quickly established a bunch of different sugar daddy, sugar baby relationships on varying levels. Some of them wanted sex from him and he would give them that. He didn't really care what they wanted. <laughs> but some of them would just kind of want to take him out on dates and they would want to see him regularly and that would be in exchange for a monthly allowance plus any gifts that he might want, any expensive clothes because all of his gifts that he would request from these people were just like varying designer clothes because his reputation was so very important to him. He loved designer clothes. Just like as a, a, a physical way to signal that he was better than you, that he was richer than you. Yeah, he loved a bit of designer. Because realistically, he couldn't afford to pay for those clothes on his own. He didn't have a job. I don't think he ever got a job, actually. I think this was his first job. But Andrew was on cloud nine <laughs> with his current life situation of drinking, dancing, partying, flirting and receiving gifts. But in 1988, when Andrew was 19 years old, his whole family life would crumble around him. It turns out his dad was a criminal? this whole time and none of them knew. So Modesto was a stockbroker. Ever since he left the army, he became a stockbroker um, and he was making seemingly decent money from it. Well, it turns out that he was embezzling a lot of money from it. He wasn't that great of a stockbroker. He was just stealing from clients and no one knew. But for a couple of months before all of this got found out, Modesto had a feeling that his employers and his clients were onto him about the, the shady goings on. And he was getting panicked. He knew that it was a matter of time before he got like seriously called out and like, th it wasn't even just a case of losing his job. Like he had stolen so much money that he would be in prison for a long ass time. He knew that he couldn't get caught. He couldn't let himself get caught. Otherwise his life would be over. Not only would he be in prison, but his reputation would be tarnished. And you know, that's the most important thing to that man. So, he stops going to work because he's scared to face them in the office. He stops answering his phone. Meanwhile, his whole family don't have a clue that this is going on, by the way. He's never told them that he's stealing and embezzling. And Modesto starts doing all this shit to prepare to go on the run, right? He starts selling his car. He sold the family home without telling the family that live in it. He sold pretty much everything and then packed up what he had left and flew off to the Philippines. He fled the whole entire country. He left his family high and dry with absolutely nothing. Not, not even the home that they lived in. They had to try and find a new place to live. They were homeless. He left his family homeless, penniless, and, le and less. Andrew's first reaction when he realized that his father had fled the country and gone to start up a new life in the Philippines, his first reaction was to go with him, to, to follow him out there and, and restart with him in the Philippines. So he did, he, he actually full on bought a plane ticket, went out there to go and see his father, but it didn't last long because obviously Modesto had no money. He was on the run from police, so he couldn't like get a job out there. He was living in poverty. He was almost destitute. And this is not how Andrew liked to live. This was not his scene. He was used to like a, a decent level of luxury. I mean, they didn't have like a big, luxurious house or anything, but he was not gonna stick around for this. So as quickly as he'd followed his father out there, he also left him there and came back to his life of luxury in California. Well, actually it was a life of luxury at this point because he had all the sugar daddies. He was earning his own money. I do find it very ironic that Modesto, a man that was so obsessed with wealth and status and reputation, ended up exiling himself to another country in, in shame. It was after this experience that Andrew promised himself that he would never end up in a situation like what he saw his father in. He would never let himself fall from grace like that. It, it was genuinely like the reputation part of it was the worst for all of them. Like they were embarrassed of their father, he was embarrassed for himself. So when Andrew got back to California, he was like, okay, I, I, gotta, I gotta grind this sugar daddy shit even harder. Like I, I need to be getting more allowances, more gifts. And so he starts trying to make his way into wealthier social circles, you know, make 
friends with richer people and meet their rich friends and then meet their rich friends. And it was working. You know what? One thing I will give Andrew Cunanan, he sounded very charming. And you know why? Because he was a liar and a narcissist and they're always the charming ones, aren't they? Because it's superficial. He would still be telling all these grandiose lies at every party, at every bar, every nightclub. And it made people like him because he sounded very interesting. So yeah, he, he very quickly... Uh, grew his empire of sugar daddies and his social circles. He was quite well known in the in the clubs that he frequented. He'd kept this part of his life a secret from his family the whole time. I believe they knew he was gay, maybe, but they didn't know that he was getting money from his lovers. But he couldn't keep it a secret forever and eventually his mother found out and she was devastated. She, Mary Ann was a very religious woman and yeah, this, this did not go well. They had like a full on shouting fight in the house and at one point, Andrew actually got up and pushed his mother against the wall and dislocated her shoulder. That's your own mother, your own aging mother. How sick. Just a side note, Andrew is very much believed to be a sociopath or a psychopath or some level of, you know, incapable of feeling empathy. And when I read that last part, I was like, yep, sounds about right. I mean, that part and the fact that he does go on to become a serial killer, that's what... <laughs> That's what this video is about. Regardless, Andrew was having the time of his life in his early 20s. He had everything he wanted, everything he needed, but it wasn't gonna last forever. The sad fact is a lot of these sugar daddies, these older wealthy men preferred very young men, like late teens, very early 20s. And Andrew was now aging beyond that bracket of very young fresh meat twink, you know? Andrew, Andrew was kind of no longer their type. Don't get me wrong, he it was still an attractive young man and there were still sugar daddies that were interested in him and wanted to continue their relationships. But some of them started kind of dropping out at this point. And actually it wasn't even just his romantic interests that had started losing interest in Andrew. It was kind of everyone. <laughs> like all the new friends that he was making were starting to see through him a bit. That's the thing with pathological liars is that they always end up catching themselves out. They, they tell the same lie slightly differently or they tell two different lies to two different people. And when you're in, social circles like this and everyone talks. People were starting to just side eye him a bit. And so yeah, he was losing friends. He was losing sugar daddies. Honestly, everything was a bit rocky for him at this point in time. Like his, uh, his mental health, his finances, obviously, cause sugar daddies are pulling out. That's like, that's like, getting demoted. It's like taking a pay cut. Even his relationships that weren't for financial benefit, like romantic relationships, cause he did have a few like genuine things with men that he met at the bars that weren't gonna pay him for his services, but he didn't mind cause he was attracted to them too. One of Andrew's most intense romantic relationships was with a man named David Madsen that he met in 1995. At that point in Andrew's life, he was very financially stable. He was being looked after by this one particularly wealthy businessman that he never really saw, but would send him two grand a month. That sounds all right. Along with all the other stuff as well, like nights out, holidays, gifts, everything, plus $2,000 a month, crazy. So when Andrew met David Madsen at the bar, he kept all of this a secret from him. You know, how he got his money and all his sugar baby activities. He kept all of that a secret. He just approached David Madsen in the bar, offered to buy him a drink. They got on really, really well. He invited David back to his hotel room because David wasn't in town for long. He was in California for a bit, but he originally lived in Minnesota. So they went back to Andrew's hotel room for you know, a little one night stand. But then, well, actually it wasn't a one night stand because they kept in touch afterwards. Albeit long distance, um, I think Andrew really liked David. So much so that when David went back to Minnesota, Andrew was always calling him and asking if he could come over and visit. And I'm not gonna lie, I don't think David was quite feeling the same about Andrew. Obviously I wasn't there, but this is just the vibe that I'm getting. And like, I have to say, I kind of, like I get it. Cause he was traveling. He had a one night stand in a different state. He probably didn't expect it to be anything serious or prolonged, but then here's this guy still hitting up his phone and asking 
to come and visit him in his hometown. Andrew was really, really taken with David. He would tell his friends that he's the love of his life. He wants to marry him one day. All that, like, like he was, he was besotted with this man that he had met one night. And he would go over to Minneapolis and meet him and he would stay at his house and like, I think they would, you know, whatever, they would have a good time while he was there, while he was in town. But as soon as he would go back to California, David would like disconnect from him again. And then in early 1997, which is the same year that all of this went down. And I don't know why I've only just put that together in my head, but this could definitely have been a trigger. Early 1997, Andrew, gets down on one knee and proposes to David. And David rejected him, so like, a bit awkward. And from that point on, their romantic relationship ended. But I think they were gonna try and stay friends because they, they did get on really, really well. They had a good friendship. And obviously Andrew was besotted with this man. So if he couldn't have him romantically, he was gonna, take him platonically. Andrew actually went to visit David one more time in Minneapolis now that they were just friends. Um, and because now he was technically single while he was over there, he decided to reconnect with an old friend slash flame, maybe? This friend was called Jeff Trail. He was 28 years old, same age as Andrew, and he had previously lived in California. That's where they made friends. They would go to all the bars and the clubs and everything together, but then Jeff moved to Minnesota. So he, he never really saw him after that. But hey, now Andrew is single and he's gonna be in Minneapolis. So he hits up Jeff Trail and he's like, hey, we, sh we should do something. I'm gonna be in town soon. So his flight touched down in Minneapolis on April 25th. And that first night he spent the whole evening with David. He was staying in David's apartment. Well, he was kind of hoping that he might be spending a couple of nights at Jeff's apartment, but his like main living arrangement for while he was there was that he was gonna stay with David. So the first night they go out for food, they have some drinks, a little catch up, a little kiki. And then he texts Jeff Trail and he says, hey, wanna come round to my apartment or the apartment I'm staying in tomorrow. And Jeff's like, okay, cool, see you there. The next day, sometime in the evening, David Madsen goes out to walk his dog. Andrew Cunanan is left in the apartment on his own and he thinks, perfect, this is, this is my time to invite over my booty call. So he texts Jeff Trail and he's like, come over now. So Jeff comes to the apartment, David's still not there. And this is where things get very intense, very quickly, and without much explanation. Very soon after Jeff arrived at the apartment, neighbors remember hearing a lot of yelling. There, there was definitely a fight going on until finally someone screamed, get the fuck out, which was then followed by a load of banging and then silence. Andrew Cunanan had just murdered Jeff Trail within 10 minutes of him arriving in the apartment and we have no idea why. Andrew had just grabbed this claw hammer that was laying on the kitchen table and used it to beat Jeff Trail to death. 27 times, he used both sides of the claw hammer as well, the, the flat part and the claw part. Like seriously, what on earth happened in that 10 minutes to inspire such a furious attack? There are some theories, none of them have ever been proven and some of them don't have much weight. Honestly, the, the like believed version of events is that there is no specific motive for this. But some people say that Jeff Trail and David Madsen had been seeing each other and maybe that's why Andrew wanted to meet up with his old friend because he found out that David was seeing him. And maybe he wanted to meet up with this old friend to kill him because he still loved David. Other people think that maybe Andrew made a sexual advance on Jeff that he wasn't comfortable with and so Andrew just killed him. But like I say, a lot of people think there was no motive. Maybe Andrew was just a ticking time bomb who was so narcissistic that it was only a matter of time until he killed someone because he didn't get his own way. But regardless of motive, this situation is so insane to me. He hadn't seen this man, hadn't spoken to him in years and years and years. He invites him over to the house for a little catch up and just fucking kills him within 10 minutes of him arriving. Andrew then, panicked and immediately set about cleaning up the crime scene because remember, David's only taken his dog for a walk 
If he's a short dog walker, then like he's back any minute. Side note, a lot of people don't think that's true. Some people think that David was in the apartment with Andrew when this all happened. And you'll see why in a minute. Either way, Andrew knew he needed to clean up this crime scene fast. So the first thing he does is roll Jeff's body up in a rug and then just shoved it in the wardrobe, like stuffed it in the wardrobe and then closed the door on it really quick. So it was just like wedged in the wardrobe. He cleaned up himself. He cleaned up as much of the crime scene as he could. Every, every surface that had blood spatter on, he cleaned, but he did miss a couple of bits. There was like a spatter that was actually outside the front door. Some people think that maybe Jeff had like turned to try to escape. Maybe he'd been leaving the house. Or oh, maybe he was attacked like right as he entered. No, cause neighbors did hear arguing. Hmm, I don't know. There was blood on the outside of the apartment anyway. And there was a piece of brain matter stuck in the door, like hinge bit grim. Later on, David returned home from his dog walk. Maybe. And after this night, the two of them went MIA. David wasn't talking to anyone. He wasn't going out and meeting up with friends. Neither was Andrew, but they were alive and they were fine. Neighbors did see them like leaving the house to walk the dog together. There were a couple of different little sightings, but they intentionally weren't talking to anyone, weren't responding to anyone. David had stopped going to work and actually his coworkers had noticed obviously and they knew where he lived so they came to his apartment and they were knocking on the door and they could hear the dog scuffling about inside and they could hear some whispers but no one came to the door so david and andrew were inside probably and just you know ignoring the world around them this was going on for days and days no one heard from david and it was getting to the point where people were concerned like his friends his family the people that like really really cared about him were like okay this isn't this isn't okay anymore we need to actually figure this out they called the police who came down um but they were very reluctant to like kick down the apartment door i don't know they were like if nothing's wrong then we can't just kick his door down for no reason like you're gonna have to pay <laughs> if if we kick his door down you have to pay for it so instead they get in touch with the building manager and they kind of explain the situation they're like look one of your tenants has gone mia everyone's worried please can you use your master key to go and check on him. And she's like, okay, cool, will do. So this lady goes to the apartment on her own. She's all alone when she unlocks that door and walks inside. Now the scene had changed a little bit from what it was uh, the last time we heard about it. So the last we heard, he'd stuffed the body in the wardrobe. But when this lady walked in, the body was still rolled up in the rug, but just propped up against the sofa. She was absolutely horrified seeing this. You would be, wouldn't you? Like, you can tell that's a dead body. Whether you can see feet sticking out or whatever, you kind of know that that's a dead body. And she'd just been told that one of her tenants was MIA. So she, she thought she had just walked in and found this tenant dead. She panicked and she just grabbed the dog because the dog was still there. The dog was all on its own. There was no one else in the apartment, just this rolled up rug and the dog. She grabs the dog and she runs downstairs and calls the police to come and check out this scene. The body was recovered from the crime scene and sent to a morgue for identification because 27 blows with a claw hammer to the head is enough to disfigure anyone. No one could look at this person, this poor man's body, and be able to identify him. He did not have facial features anymore. In fact, the only way that he could be identified in the end was through a tattoo on his leg. And this was when they realized that this was 28 year old Jeffrey Trail and not David Madsen, the tenant that they thought they had found dead in his own apartment. They're now realizing that this guy's body in the rug is just like some other guy that they didn't know. They didn't have him in connection with, with any of this at all. So the immediate theory when they found this was that maybe David Madsen had killed Jeff Trail and now David was on the run. He was hiding. So police set about trying to locate him, obviously, thinking that they've got a killer on the loose. And seven days later, David Madsen was found dead. He had washed up on the shore of a lake and he had been shot in the head. Someone had murdered 
him. He'd actually been shot three times, once in the back and twice in the head. And it's been theorized that the first one in his back was probably as he was running away from his attacker. He was trying to escape. They shot him in the back, got him down onto the ground and then approached him and shot him twice in the head. His body was sent for an autopsy where it was actually revealed that he hadn't been dead all that long. It had only been about 48 hours, probably more like 24 actually, which is crazy considering it had been seven days since they found his apartment empty. So he'd been on the run for like five or six days. So David had been alive the whole time that he'd been missing, but now someone, and I'm sure you can guess who, had murdered him. Where David's body was found was about 50 miles away from his house. So not local at all. The people around there didn't really know of David or Andrew. But when they were shown pictures by the police, a cafe owner actually recognized them and said that David and Andrew had been in there like, the day before David's body was found. So they had been together right up until the day that David clearly died. So it was Andrew, it had to be Andrew. Thinking of this from police's POV at this point in time, they thought that David Madsen had murdered Jeff Trail and they were just gonna try and find David and apprehend him. Now they were finding out that the prime suspect in the first murder case has been murdered himself and there's been another guy there the whole time. Now, Andrew was on the run on his own. It, it seemed like now they had to find him. So naturally now, Andrew Cunanan was the prime suspect in both of the murders. Police had confirmed at this point that Andrew was staying with David at the time, like a bunch of his stuff, his, um, his literally his luggage with his name tag in it was found in David's apartment. So they knew that he'd been there when Jeff was murdered. Everything was connecting now. They knew they needed to find him fast, but they had no idea where he was. They had no leads, they had nothing. And it was scary. He'd already seemingly murdered two people. How many more was he gonna go on to kill? After killing David, Andrew traveled all the way to Chicago to avoid being detected because he knew that it was only a matter of time until the bodies were found and he wanted to be as far away as possible. When he got to Chicago, he set about finding some temporary accommodation for himself. He needed a house, he needed somewhere to live, but he was realizing that he was very stuck for options. You're a double murderer on the run, what are your options? Sleep in your car, sleep in like a sleazy motel or like something like that. But this is Andrew Cunanan we're talking about. So he didn't want to do either of those things. He was a bit of a princess when it came to things like this. He liked high standards and nice places. He wasn't just gonna go stay in any motel. He refused to compromise his luxury living. So he came up with a new plan. He was gonna scope out a nice big house and he was gonna wait until the residents came home, then kill them and then just live in their house. That is an absolutely insane plan. But I guess to be fair, after you've murdered two people, it, sanity is out of the window, isn't it? So Andrew arrives in this neighborhood of these great big houses and he's watching them all for a bit, seeing who's coming in and out. And then he spots an elderly man going in and out of this house and there's no one else with him. He seems like he lives on his own, which sadly made him an ideal target for Andrew Cunanan. The man's name was Lee Miglin. He was a 72 year old retired property developer, real estate developer. He was a very wealthy man. And he didn't actually live alone, by the way. He had a wife, but she was out of town at the time of this case. It was May 4th, 1997, when Andrew approached Lee Miglin. He'd waited until he arrived back home. And then as Lee was entering his own front door, Andrew appeared behind him with a gun. He held it to his back and guided Lee inside his own home. And once they'd shut that door, Andrew attacked him. He dragged Lee off into his own garage where he proceeded to tie his wrists and his ankles and torture him. Like this is how you know that Andrew Cunanan just enjoyed killing people and inflicting pain and terror on others. Andrew doesn't gain anything from torturing his victims. He was just enjoying it. He subjected Lee Miglin to an extensive beating that broke 
several of his ribs. He was using a bunch of different weapons to do this, like heavy objects. And he also, when Lee was like laid down on the ground, Andrew grabbed these massive concrete bags and just dropped them on his body. That'll, that'll have been what crushed a lot of his ribs. Actually, Andrew made use of a lot of the gardening equipment that was around them, because remember, he dragged him to the garage. So he grabbed a gardening glove and used it as a gag. He like stuffed it inside Lee's mouth. He then grabbed a pair of shears and used it to stab Lee in the chest about four or five times. And then he grabbed a garden saw and used it to slice Lee's throat almost completely decapitating him. It was completely one side to the other. And of course, with a laceration that wide, he lost a lot of blood and very quickly succumbed to his injuries. Andrew then picked up Lee's dead body and just stuffed it behind some bins in the garage, which I think is just awful, especially after everything that has just happened, for this man to just be like shoved behind some bins as if he's part of the trash. That makes me so upset. Once he'd taken care of the, the blood and the crime scene, Andrew then wandered back out into the house. He wanted to go for a tour of the house that he'd just killed for. He very quickly made himself at home. He ate the food from the fridge. He went and had a bath. He shaved using his murder victim's razor. He, cause obviously he had like rugged facial hair at this point, he'd been on the run for a little while. So he shaved all that off. And then he listened to the voicemails that had been left on Lee Miglin's house phone. And one of those voicemails was from his wife. Her name was Marilyn. She'd been away for a week and she was due to return home literally the next day. And this was mentioned in the voicemail that she'd left for her husband. So now Andrew knew that he only had one day. Not even that, he didn't know how quickly she was gonna make it back from the airport and stuff. So he knew his time was limited in this house. So that night, Andrew slept in Lee's bed and then woke up bright and early to be able to get himself the hell out of there before Lee's wife came home. Oh, and he stole a bunch of shit on the way out as well. A load of cash, um, thousands of dollars worth of clothes from Lee Miglet, like uh, nice suits and stuff. Cause Lee was a businessman. He had a lot of like nice suits. Of course, Andrew Cunanan was having all of them. And then he fled the scene in Lee Miglin's car. As soon as his wife got home that day, even before she got home, she knew that something was terribly wrong. Her husband wasn't there to pick her up from the airport as he always was. So she had to find her own way home. And then when she got there, the car was stolen. The house was a mess. So she called the police and she said, look, someone's broken into my house, stolen my car. I can't find my husband anywhere. He will have been in when this all happened and now I'm scared, I don't know where he is. So police come down and they start to help her. They, they take a description of her husband. They're gonna file a missing persons report. Meanwhile, another team of officers are going around the house and you know, seeing what's been stolen, what's been damaged. And then they come across Lee's body in the garage. It was very clear that this had been a home invasion and Lee had been murdered as part of it and they'd been terribly robbed. This case was a total mystery to the police at first because, well, a lot of home invasion robberies are because there's usually not a link between the victim and the perpetrator. Marilyn didn't know of anyone that would, you know, specifically want to do this to her husband. It must have just been someone that knew he was wealthy and knew that they could easily overpower a 72 year old man that was on his own. And that is what happened. Police thought it was just a totally random home invasion. That was until a Jeep was found just down the road and it was abandoned. Like it had been like parked on the side of this road for a good few days. So eventually, Someone called the police and they were like, I think there's a car abandoned on this street. They come and get it. They run the plates on the system. This was Andrew Cunanan's own Jeep that he had left just abandoned at the scene of the crime. So this told police everything they needed to know. A guy that is on the run because he is responsible for two murders has just ditched his car near this other murder scene. Of course he's responsible. And it was clear that Andrew had obviously ditched his own car there and then used Lee's car to continue on the run. 
And Andrew wasn't stupid. He knew that police were gonna figure this out very quickly and he knew he needed to ditch this car soon. Like he needed to find a new one to steal to take over from this one because police were gonna be looking for this one. It was eventually found on May 10th, about a week, just short of a week after Lee's murder. And it was actually found in New Jersey. It was parked outside a cemetery as well, very creepy. But police were horrified to learn that the circumstances surrounding this abandoned car were very similar, if not identical, to the circumstances surrounding the last abandoned stolen car. A panicked wife had called the police saying that her husband was missing, their car was missing, and now this random car has just appeared abandoned. It looked like Andrew Cunanan had struck again, this time in New Jersey, and there was another missing husband. It was a 45 year old man named William Reese, or Bill, he went by Bill. He was a cemetery caretaker, so that's why the car was abandoned outside the cemetery, because that's where Bill and his car were for Andrew to have been able to swap. Bill had gone to work on this particular day and just not returned home, which was unlike him. Him and his wife had their little routine. She would cook them dinner on an evening and he would come in from work and they would sit together. But she, that night she was just waiting and waiting and he wasn't coming home. So she decided to go down to the cemetery and see if everything was okay. When she arrived at the cemetery, she found well, she found that their car wasn't there, first of all. Bill had a truck and he parked it right outside his little office building in the cemetery. Every day. Office building. You know, you know in cemeteries they have those like little outhouse shed type things. He had one of those um, and he would park his truck there every day. It wasn't there. And there was just this random other car outside the cemetery, the only one around. So immediately his wife is worried and she knows that something's not right. And she goes into his office and nothing seems amiss in there at first, although there is a radio playing Christian music full blast. But that's it. So this is when she calls the police and she says she can't find her husband anywhere, he's not at work and his car is gone. She's worried. Police come down to the scene to speak to her and file a report. Meanwhile, again, just as last time, another couple of officers start doing a bit of a search at the scene. And that was when they found William Reese but he was dead. It turns out there was a basement part underneath Bill's office and it seemed that Andrew Cunanan had guided him down there and murdered him there. Kind of similar to how he guided Lee Miglin into his own garage and carried out the murder there. Although this time he hadn't tortured his victim. That was only Lee for some reason. He'd simply shot Bill Reese to death and then taken off in his car. He hadn't done anything else at that crime scene. So now he was on the run in, an, in another new car in this pickup truck. And for a while, police didn't have any leads on him. They were looking for this pickup truck and they just could not, they couldn't locate it, no one could. He'd managed to drive the pickup truck all the way to Miami Beach, Florida. And he checked himself into a hotel called the Normandy Plaza Hotel. Side note, a lot of people have said they think Andrew Cunanan would have hated it there. It was quite like tacky, gaudy. It was a cheap hotel. He needed cheap at this point because he didn't have money. It was $32 a night or if you wanted a bit of a cheaper package deal, you could pay $29 for a week. And at first Andrew was paying it nightly. And then after a while he realized Police aren't finding him here. So he starts paying for it by the week. He was there for a while. And I think the reason he was managing to lay low is because he wasn't really using the pickup truck anymore. He used it to get to Florida, but then from there, he just kind of had it parked at the hotel and he was just kind of doing everything on foot. So to summarize, because I feel like this has been such a, a roller coaster. At this point, Andrew had murdered four people. The first two were friends or acquaintances. Jeffrey Trail, who he beat to death, and then David Madsen, who he kind of took on the run with him for a while and then eventually shot him and left him in a lake. And then his last two murders seemed to be crimes of opportunity. He killed Lee Miglin so that he could use his house and steal his car and Bill Reese, well, again, for his car. And at this point, Andrew Cunanan had made it onto the FBI's most wanted list. But annoyingly, the appeals for information were very much focused on that pickup truck because they thought that he would be 
actively driving it wherever he was. So these these appeals really, really focused on that car, on its plates, on the colour, on the model, everything. Meanwhile, he wasn't driving it. So for a whole month, he managed to lay low at this hotel. No one suspected him. Everyone treated him fine and, and normal because he was just a, a normal guy. That was until he did something really stupid, actually. He decided to take one of the rings that he stole from Lee Miglin to a pawn shop and sell it under his real name as well. And this is so stupid because pawn shops regularly have to send like an itinerary of all the things that they've bought just in case it's stolen items and they send it to the police for a review. So obviously Andrew Cunanan's own real name is gonna be on this report next to this little ring that has been stolen from Lee Miglin. Well, I guess this would be a problem if police actually check those lists. Shade, the, like the police had that information on their desk and they didn't actually see it until after this whole case. So even though he made that mess up, it didn't actually affect anything. And just days after he pawned that ring and almost got caught, Andrew committed his final murder. And this would be the one that made him infamous when he decided to murder global fashion icon Gianni Versace. I'm sure you are very familiar with the Versace name and the brand. If not, where have you been? <laughs> it's a very luxurious, high fashion designer that originally specialized in like women's wear, sexy dresses, uh, but now they just dominate a lot of markets. They have homeware, menswear, kids wear, everything. Jewelry, fragrance, oh, don't we all love a Versace perfume? Gianni Versace emerged as a very famous and successful designer at a very, very young age. He was about 26 when he first started making like major moves, which is insane because he didn't have connections in the, f not in the big fashion industry, like designer fashion industry when he started out. His connections to the industry were his own mother, which I think is very sweet. That's how he got into fashion designing is because his mother was a seamstress and he used to sit and watch her as a kid and she would make these beautiful dresses and he would be just in awe at how his mother had done that. So she was the one that taught Gianni how to sew and how to design and measure and everything, everything. She planted the seeds for Versace, the brand. And family has always been a very, very big part of the Versace brand. I'm sure a lot of you know Donatella Versace, who is an absolute icon, mainly for her Instagram comments on absolutely everything ever, Donatella Versace. But she has worked at Versace pretty much the whole entire time in some way. She's done a lot of creative help, and I believe she's now vice president, go girl. Their brother, Santa, also worked for Versace. There's three siblings. <laughs> There's three Versace siblings and they all worked for Versace in the beginning. Santo was on like the financial side of things. So it was a family affair and I'm sure the Versace family were very, very proud of their children. At the height of his career, Gianni Versace and the, the brand itself were known for pushing boundaries because at the time everything was quite modest and respectful and like muted colors and whatever but Versace was not here for that. He wanted to make sexy. He was using leather and lace and cutouts and bold colors. And this was something that a lot of big luxury designers were a little bit, no, they weren't very keen on experimenting with all of that because it was sometimes seen as tacky or not very classy. But I think this is why Versace really hit the nail on the head because he managed to find that middle ground between like gaudy and slay, you know? Like he, he smashed it. There's actually a famous quote that goes, Armani dresses the wife, Versace dresses the mistress. And I think that says everything about what he was going for. He wanted to make sexy lady clothes, you know? <laughs> Everything else was just a bit boring, you know, long dresses and like m muted teal or whatever. And he came and slid. He was aiming for that like young, seductive, sexy, fun, free kind of vibe. Gianni Versace himself was openly gay and he lived in the Miami Beach area of Florida, which is 
a very gay area or at least at the at the time maybe it wasn't but it was very accepting of gays and he was like royalty there everyone knew that Gianni Versace lived there because he was he was quite down to earth in the way that he would just like be walking down the street didn't always have like major security around him he would go and sit at the local cafes and enjoy a conversation with the locals. And he was very heavily involved in the gay scene in Miami Beach, Florida. He was at all the clubs, all the bars. And to be fair, he is Gianni Versace. So he was very much involved in any club scene that he wanted to be in. No matter what city he was in, no matter what state he was in, he was royalty wherever he went. It's actually been speculated that Gianni Versace and Andrew Cunanan might have crossed paths at some point in like a club or a party or an event. They did attend some of the same things, which is why people think this, because like there's a good chance that they probably did meet, whether it was briefly in passing, just an introduction, or whether they like actually had a conversation, we don't know, but we think they met. And Andrew, for years after this potential meeting, would tell everyone that he is good friends with Gianni Versace. Good friends. It's like hard to know where the truth lies when it comes to Andrew Cunanan because pathological liar, obviously. Like, obviously they're not besties, but like maybe there was a little bit of truth in some of it. I don't know. Some people think there might have even been a little bit of a, you know, like more than friends moment happening, but there's absolutely no proof of that. And also Versace's family have said that he he didn't know Andrew Cunanan. And, and let's be real, when you're as famous as Gianni Versace, uh, you're probably not gonna remember people that you have very brief run-ins with at random events. Uh, so he probably had no idea who Andrew Cunanan was. Some people speculate that Andrew uh, could have held a lot of resentment for Gianni because uh, they weren't friends? I don't know. Because Andrew had built up this like fake friendship with him in his head and in his life when he talks to his friends. He loves Gianni Versace, his friend Gianni Versace, but in reality he knows that Gianni's not his friend. People think that he might have just like built up his own resentment in his head from lying to himself. And it's worth pointing out that Gianni Versace was everything that Andrew Cunanan wanted to be but wasn't. He was rich and famous and successful and he had a boyfriend and a big massive mansion and he was like famous within the gay scene as well, which was a huge thing for the time because this was around about the AIDS crisis. And a lot of people still did have rotten attitudes towards gay men specifically. But Gianni Versace was a globally celebrated gay man. That was, even more special and even more what Andrew wished he could have been. So a lot of people believe that just general jealousy and resentment and, well, I don't really know. A lot of people think that was his motive for the murder, but it seems very specific for him to drive all the way to Miami Beach, Florida and seek out Gianni Versace to murder him as his last victim. Just over what, like a bit of jealousy? Well, actually there's also the element of famous person. And if you murder a famous person, a lot of people are gonna talk about that and Andrew himself would then become infamous. Maybe that was what he was going for and maybe he just knew where Gianni Versace lived. So maybe he just knew how to get there and how to do it quickly. So on July 15th, 1997, Andrew took the stolen pickup truck and parked it at a garage just a few streets away from Gianni Versace's home. By the way, he had left the hotel without paying his last bill, just completely ditched, ghosted, knew that he was never coming back. It's not known exactly what Andrew did when he left the car in the garage. We don't know if he was stalking Gianni all morning or what he did to be fair, we don't know, <laughs> we don't know. All we do know is Gianni Versace's version of what happened. And that was just a very normal Tuesday morning. He was an early riser, he was a workaholic, his husband said, husband or boyfriend? 
I don't know if they were married, his partner, um, said that he was a workaholic and always used to wake up early to get going with things and get putting his ideas down and everything. So Gianni woke up on this Tuesday morning. Uh, he left his boyfriend in bed asleep uh, while he went for a walk to the local cafe and he would go and pick up a bunch of magazines once a week. He liked to stay in the know of everything, especially in the fashion world. He would pick up his magazines and then he would go and sit at a cafe and have some breakfast. And yeah, he was having a great morning. All these usuals saw him, you know, the, the guy at the magazine stall and the guy at the cafe. He said his usual good mornings. And then he made his way back to his house right around the time that Andrew Cunanan arrived. Gianni walked the few steps at the front of his house and he had this big gate that was always locked, obviously. And as he stood there rummaging around for his key, Andrew Cunanan approached him from behind and just point blank shot him in the back of the head twice. And he just fell to the floor. That was it, he'd, he'd killed him that quickly. And at this point, Gianni's partner was actually sat like just inside the garden part having coffee. And so he heard the gunshots. He heard the gunshots that killed his partner. He rushed out to the gate to see what the noise was and he saw his boyfriend's body just laying on the steps to their home in a pool of his own blood. I can't imagine how horrifying that must have been for him to see. Like I've seen crime scene photos of the steps and even just the blood on the stairs is so harrowing. It, You know when you get that feeling when you see certain true crime things or you hear certain stories and it just guts you. Like that photo, I saw it and I nearly threw up. Just to know that that was where he was standing that, that exact spot is where he lost his life. Oh my God. This attack was very different to Andrew Cunanan's previous murders because, well, this one was in broad daylight on a street. It had loads of witnesses, like he'd never done that before. And it didn't seem like he really cared. One woman actually saw all of this happen. And then she watched as Andrew just walked normally down the street and away. And no one was trying to capture him or anything. Like no one was trying to, well, to be fair, he had a gun, obviously. Sorry, I had a stupid moment then, but like no one was trying to tackle him or anything. And she was stunned and terrified. So she just kind of watched him walk away after just shooting someone and killing them. So yeah, he fled the scene on foot and he walked to that garage a couple of streets away where he'd left the pickup truck. He'd actually left a spare pair of clothes, spare pair of clothes, spare change of clothes in the car. He got changed real quick and then he left. Yeah, he left the pickup truck and his old clothes just uh, abandoned there and he walked back out into the street. And I mean, now he looked completely different and he was able to just slip away undetected. Meanwhile, Gianni Versace had been transferred to the nearest hospital, but he was pronounced dead before 10 a.m. It didn't take long for police to actually find the abandoned pickup truck in the garage. And of course, as soon as they found that, they knew Andrew Cunanan was responsible for Gianni Versace's murder. It's a dead giveaway. Whenever you find an Andrew Cunanan stolen abandoned car at the scene of a murder, there's your answer. Inside the truck, they found all of Andrew's belongings. It seemed like he'd just kind of ditched most of his stuff. And they also found some bits belonging to Lee Miglin and Bill Reese. So now Andrew Cunanan has murdered five people and he's highly likely to strike again. I mean, this man would just keep going and going and going until something else puts a stop to him. And now that he'd murdered a huge celebrity, the case was now getting like, 10 times more media coverage than it was in the first place. And in the first place, it was already getting a lot because this man is on the FBI most wanted list. So yeah, the coverage on the case was already pretty big, but now it was mega. Andrew Cunanan's picture, his description, everything about him was plastered everywhere. On posters, flyers, on news network channels, uh, newspapers, absolutely everything. He was everywhere and everyone knew to be on the lookout for him. But Andrew managed to avoid detection for over a week. Somehow he was like one of the most wanted men in the whole country, but they couldn't find him. They didn't know where he was. Despite the FBI literally getting like hundreds of tips and leads and mentions, sightings even. None of them went anywhere. Maybe some of them were him, but by the time police managed to follow up on it, he was already gone. That was until July 23rd, 1997. Andrew Cunanan's time on the run was finally up. 
It was all sparked by a 79 year old man named Fernando Carrera, who was a caretaker for a very wealthy businessman's houseboat. And this was a swish houseboat. Like this was really cool. It's like two stories and it's just floating on water. They don't have them where I'm from. It, it was so cool. So this businessman has this houseboat and obviously because he is a very wealthy businessman, has lots of different properties and is always everywhere. So he hires Fernando to take care of the place while he's gone. On this particular day, Fernando arrived at the houseboat and immediately before he even started to enter the house, he knew that something was wrong. The lock on the front door was broken and there were even a couple of lights on inside. There was a light on in one of the upstairs bedrooms and obviously Fernando knew that the guy he worked for wasn't in, so someone else was. Someone else had broken into this houseboat and now he was gonna have to deal with it. So he pushed open the door into the living room and again, he saw more proof that someone had broken in. The sofa had moved and there was even a pair of shoes just sitting by the sofa. So it seemed that the intruder was still in there with his feet out. <laughs> Fernando was actually armed at the time. And so it was at this point that he decided to pull his gun and prepare to make his way through the house to go and find this intruder. But as he did, he heard a gunshot ring out from upstairs. Fernando panicked. Now he knew that the intruder was also armed. It wasn't worth trying to, trying to confront them, trying to catch them himself. It just wasn't worth it. Fernando turned and ran the hell out of that houseboat. He got back into his car and he called the police and basically told them this whole situation that there's an intruder in his house and he believes that they've just shot at him. That's a very, very serious case at the best of times. An active shooter in a house is very scary. That shit needs surrounding, you need SWAT teams and everything. But what makes it even worse is that police already kind of knew that this was Andrew Cunanan. It had been about a week since he'd killed Gianni Versace and so they were waiting for him to crop up any day now and this sounded very characteristic of an Andrew Cunanan attack. And they knew that if it was him, this could be very, very dangerous, very, very scary. So they sent out the big dogs. They sent police, FBI agents, SWAT teams, bloody armed forces, absolutely everyone was sent to surround this house and make sure that they finally caught Andrew Cunanan. Once they arrived and they'd got stationed circling the house, they knew they needed to establish communication with the intruder inside the house because he was clearly armed. So entering the building wasn't an option. He could just shoot at them if they did. So negotiators start just shouting <laughs> into the house and they're not getting any responses and they start using like big megaphone thingies. Oh, I'm guessing it's not one like that, is it? I had a very comical image in my head of them using like a big megaphone. I guess they have like police ones. Anyway, they were shouting up to him, no response whatsoever. N there was no movement. There was no, there was absolutely nothing. When it was clear that the intruder wasn't gonna shout back to them, someone even threw a phone into the houseboat window at the top I don't know, to call him? I don't know, did they call? I don't actually know why or what the idea was there, but nothing happened anyway. For five whole hours, police officers were outside that houseboat trying to establish communication with this silent intruder. They hadn't heard a single peep come from that house the whole time. But of course, during this time, during the five hours, the news had spread like wildfire that they thought they had Andrew Cunanan surrounded. Every media outlet, every reporter, every journalist, every photographer wanted to get in on this story as quickly as it was happening. Everyone wanted to be the first ones to report on it. So reporters are flocking to the scene. Luckily, police had already blocked off like a good few roads behind this houseboat, so no one could get too close but a couple of very, very wealthy media outlets decided to send over helicopters above the scene, chuck a couple of photographers up there and get some photos. And actually one of these helicopter journalists started a live broadcast of the scene on the news, which this is actually a, a really dangerous thing for a situation like this because 
Well, he's locked himself in a house with TVs in there. He could watch the news. He could watch the police surrounding him and figure out like where they are, what their strategies are. I mean, I suppose it wouldn't do anything. He's one man versus the armed forces. It's dangerous. They should. They can't give that kind of intel to the intruder inside the house. So police are thinking, we cannot let Andrew Cunanan see the TV. <laughs> we can't let him see the news right now. So they cut the power lines to the houseboat so there's no way he could turn on a TV in there. And it was at this point that they decide to try and make entry. They throw a load of tear gas in through the windows and the doors and with all their protective gear on, they go inside. When they got up to the top floor bedroom, that's where they found Andrew Cunanan laying on the bed, already dead and cold. He'd been dead for a while, this whole time. He had been dead. Turns out that shot that Fernando had heard was not someone shooting at him, but it was Andrew Cunanan shooting himself. Finally, his spontaneous reign of terror was over. After five whole months, five victims, six deaths, including his own. And in fact, he used the same gun to kill himself that he had used to kill a lot of his victims. He didn't leave a note or like a final message to the world or anything, no explanations. That was just it it was over. And we still don't really know why any of this even happened in the first place. None of his crimes seem to have a motive. Well, I guess apart from the murders of Lee Miglin and Bill Reese, those two, the motive seemed to be just convenience. He needed a new car, he needed a house to wash up and shave in. But it's those first two deaths and, and Gianni Versace as well, like that is so random. Naturally, people have tried to speculate and theorize what his motives could have been. One of which was that Andrew Cunanan could have been HIV positive and trying to get revenge on the person that transmitted it to him. And this theory actually started from Andrew himself, kind of. When he was alive, he had mentioned to his friends a couple of times that he was worried he might be HIV positive, but he hadn't been tested and he didn't know, but he was worried, he was scared, and he was angry at whoever could have potentially given him it. Because especially at that time, contracting AIDS or becoming HIV positive was more than just the health issue in itself. It was what that would do to you socially or like romantically. People didn't want to associate with people that were HIV positive. It was like social suicide, which is so sad. People didn't understand it then. But that was one thing that worried a lot of people about testing HIV positive was you know, what other people would think and how they would treat them. So actually a lot of people didn't even get tested. So I guess the theory is that he just went around killing people that he'd slept with in the past, just in case they were the one that gave him HIV. I don't know, there's no, there's absolutely no confirmation of any of that. And if anything, I mean, I personally don't believe this theory. When an autopsy was done on Andrew Cunanan's body, he was found to not be, be HIV positive. So, um, I don't know. I do think there could be some level of motive in that like ex-partner theory. Not necessarily HIV, but like maybe he had slept with at least the first two. I think I mentioned this earlier on, but some people think that his first two victims, Jeff and David, might have been involved together. And so maybe the first killing was like jealousy and anger. And then the next two were convenience. And then the last one, Gianni Versace was for infamy. At this point, he was a serial killer and no matter how he was caught or died or whatever, he was gonna be found out. Everyone was gonna find out that he was a serial killer one day, so might as well be the infamous one that murdered Gianni Versace. That's my own theory anyway. The, the one that confuses me the most is the first one of Jeff Trail, how he was murdered within 10 minutes of arriving at the apartment. But I think it makes sense that after the first killing, he just kind of devolved into insanity. And by the fifth killing of Gianni Versace, he didn't have anything to lose. And so I think he was just insane at that point in time. And so yeah, he continued. He just kept going with it. In the aftermath of Gianni Versace's murder, his sister Donatella took over pretty much 
all of his uh, roles within the company. And her daughter, Allegra, is actually the heiress of Versace. Gianni was absolutely obsessed with her and her younger brother, I believe, but she was his first, like, his sister's first child and she was a little angel to him and so he left his whole empire to her. Although she is um, older now, she's an adult and she does not like uh, celebrity. She, you know what, I was reading up on her and she seems so cool. Uh, she just likes to sit at home and watch Netflix and she is not interested in these big fashion shows and parties and being known and doing interviews and stuff. So Donatella pretty much does all that. She's kind of the face of Versace these days while Allegra does work there, but she is a private person who works behind the scenes. And I respect that, get your bag girl. And that is all I have on this case. Thank you so, so much for watching. This has been an absolute corker. Thanks again to NordVPN for sponsoring this video. Remember, if you go to nordvpn.com forward slash Eleanor, there'll be a special offer waiting for you there. And it's completely risk-free with NordVPN's 30 day money back guarantee. But yeah, thank you so, so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed and you wanna watch another one, there should be one on screen for you right now, enjoy. And also if you click the circle with my little face in, then you can subscribe to my channel because I post true crime content every single week and with that I will see you next time. Bye!